Our first lesson is taken from Jeremiah chapter 33. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called, the Lord our righteous Savior. This is the word of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. He made his usual half-hour commute to work every day. Normally he popped in a podcast and it, the drive flew by, but today it felt like the longest trip he had ever been on. He was dreading the conversation that he knew he was about to have when he got to work. It may have been the most wonderful time of the year for everyone else, but not for him. See, it was the busy season, and his job required all hands on deck. So this time of year, he liked to unwind, combat the holiday stress with a couple of drinks before bed. Well, sometimes a couple of drinks turned into a few too many drinks, and before he knew it, he was waking up with the mother of all headaches with his alarm blaring two hours after he was supposed to be clocking in for work for the third time in two weeks. When he got there, he was getting fired. What else would happen to someone who did that? He needed this job. His rent was already late. He was being buried under the interest on his credit cards alone. Without this job, he'd be out on the streets in a couple of days. He was in the worst, most pitiful position he had ever been in. And it was all his fault. Have you ever found yourself in a worst-case scenario that you got yourself into? Maybe it's your homework is late again because you had more important things to do, like talk with friends and play video games. Maybe it's, it's that you have no filter and you just say the first thing that comes into your mind and it got you into trouble again. Maybe you just have a huge pile of of work because you are really, really good at procrastinating. I mean, even if you're not having these problems, even if you're kind of generally pretty responsible, we can all relate, we can all think of a time that we have gotten ourselves into a situation, we have dug ourselves into a hole with no way out, and we're to blame. And all you can do in that situation is take the consequences head on. In general, you know, we get through it. We, we take the consequences and, and the mistake, it hurts, and the consequences, they hurt, but we learn from the mistake, and, and life tends to go on. See, the real issue is not that we have dug ourselves into a hole with one another. The real issue is that we dig ourselves into a hole before God. God demands that we be righteous. He wants us to live a, a morally excellent and perfect lifestyle like a, a knight in shining armor. Everything they do is pure and virtuous. They stand up for what is right. They stand against evil. They stand up for the down, downtrodden. Often we trod over the downtrodden in order to kind of lift ourselves up a little bit. Uh, if you look into our heart's you won't find every kind of virtue and purity. Instead, you'll find every kind of vice. If we were to describe our actions accurately and honestly, it wouldn't be everything good and excellent. If we were to describe our actions honestly, they would be bad. What we do is evil in God's sight. We have dug ourselves into a hole with God and the consequence is not losing your job or pushing away a friend. The consequence is pushing away the only real source of good in this world. It's cutting yourself off from the loving presence of God. And the only person we have to blame is ourselves. That's the situation the Israelites found themselves in. 
in a uh, situation with no way out, a horrible predicament, and the only people they had to blame was themselves. They had enjoyed God's blessings in the past. They had been on God's good side. They were his chosen people. He had given them so many promises. He gave them a a king, a, a great king, a righteous king, King David. And what made King David so great was he trusted in the Lord and he led his people down that same path of righteousness. God promised him his kingdom would last for and that there would always be a, a son of David on the throne. It did not take long for God's people to turn their back on God. See, after David died, there was a string of bad kings of unrighteous kings who led their people down that same unrighteous path. Time after time, the Israelites disobeyed God. They turned their back on Him towards other gods. They went after all sorts of worldly wealth. They made alliances with people they shouldn't have until finally God said, okay, you're going to reject me. Have it your way. God cut His people off. And now they were a nation in exile, a nation without a home, a nation without a temple to worship in. God let them sit in the hole they dug for themselves. God had every right to cut his people off forever. They deserved it. God has every right to cut you and me off forever. We deserve it. Instead, the Lord declares, the days are coming when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. See, God had made a a good promise. He promised David his kingdom would last forever. He promised him a a son who would would rule on that throne forever. Not a a dictator who rules his his whole life by, by oppressing the people to stay in power. A king who would reign with justice and righteousness, a king who would usher in an era of era of peace and joy. Who wouldn't want to look forward to this kingdom? A, a king that would save God's people. It seemed like it was too late. The, the line of David, David's dynasty had been cut off. It was nothing more than a stump. But God was going to raise a king for his people. And this is the name by which he would be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. We have to spend a little bit of time talking about this translation. The NIV, the New International Version, it's a good translation, but right here they, they do something that I, I don't agree with. See, in, in the original language in Hebrew, it doesn't say the Lord, our righteous Savior. They add that word Savior. It just says the Lord, our righteousness. I think they do that so that if somebody is reading this passage and they don't have a lot of knowledge about the Bible, they they read it and they think to themselves, that sounds like Jesus. That sounds like the one who came to save his people from their sins. And they're right. That is Jesus. He is the righteous king. He is the one who lived an upright, virtuous, perfect, excellent life. But Jesus didn't look like a king. He was born in a stable. His first visitors were a couple of lowly shepherds, still stinking from being out in the field. His dad was a, a humble carpenter. He never amounted to much in terms of power and, and wealth. The closest Jesus got was riding into Jerusalem when he was like 33 years old on the back of a donkey. The people treated him as if he were a king. By the end of that week, our king was crowned with thorns and being crucified as a common criminal. Jesus didn't look like a king. Is he the one, the, the righteous king coming to rescue his people? Is he? How could he? Who would be afraid of someone like that? Who would, would tremble in fear? How could he defeat his enemies? I've got to go back to that translation again. It adds in the word Savior, and it it takes away from one of the most important, powerful, beautiful teachings in the Bible. 
Jesus is more than a righteous knight coming to save his people. Jesus is our righteousness. He is the Lord, our righteousness. He is righteousness for us. That man, late, on his way to work, about to get fired, about to get what he deserved, he arrives to work, and and waiting outside at the door for him is not his manager. It's the owner of the company and his son. And he gets out, and the, the owner says, I've been looking at your record. It's got to say, you're, a, you're terrible. You're late more often than you're on time. Your work quality is abysmal. You're, you're starting fights like every other week. We're actually losing money and customers because of you. The policy is clear. We have to let you go. But my son's record is perfect. And he's agreed. He's decided that he's going to give you his record and he's going to take your record. So today we're going to be firing him and we're going to be giving you the raise he deserved. (laughs) It doesn't make sense. No employer would do that. It's not wise. It's not fair. That's what God did for us. Jesus is our righteousness. He came as a humble human being. He took our place. He became our sin, took all of our sins on himself and died for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. In Christ, there is no condemnation for sinners. In Christ, there are no sins left to be accounted for. You are clean. You have been set free. All of your sins, your mistakes, your failures are gone. Jesus is your righteousness. There's something of else that's really important in this translation. Or not even, just, just something really important in this text to take note of. You're probably familiar with this verse that the Lord, he will be called the Lord our righteousness. This is actually a, uh, not a duplicate, but saying the same thing again. God made the same promise, well, almost the same promise in Jeremiah chapter 23. But there's a few key differences. In Jeremiah chapter 23, it reads, He will be called the Lord your righteous, our righteousness. If you look at Jeremiah chapter 20, or 33, verse 16, it says, This is the name by which it will be called the Lord, our righteousness. Now, both promises have Jesus in mind. Jesus is the righteous branch of David. He is the king coming to set his people free from their sins. But our text today adds on another layer to that original promise. It, Jerusalem, will be called the Lord, our righteousness. What right does anyone have to call Jerusalem the Lord, Well, it's God calling Jerusalem the Lord our righteousness. God can call Jerusalem whatever he wants, but we still want to know why he calls it that. And it's important for us to know why he calls it that. When the Old Testament prophets prophesied, their prophecy was, it had layers to it. There there were even multiple fulfillments. So on the surface level, this prophecy about Jerusalem and Israel is about Literal Jerusalem and Israel, the people of of the Old Testament, they were in exile in Babylon and God was going to save them. But on a deeper level, this prophecy looks forward to the time when Jesus, God's righteous branch of David, would come to set his people free from their sins. It looks forward to the New Testament time. And in that New Testament time, everyone who believes in Jesus Everybody right now who believes in Jesus is a member of God's people. So when this prophecy talks about Jerusalem, it's looking ahead to the church of God. All right, so Jerusalem, the church, is the Lord, our righteousness. That still sounds a little bit weird to our ears. It's not as uncommon as we think in the Bible for God to place his name on the church. For example, 
God calls the church the body of Christ, which is an even closer connection than having the same name. The church is the body, Christ is the head. Every time a believer is baptized, they are baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God places His name on that believer. Whenever I say at the end of the service, the Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you, the Lord look on you with favor and give you peace, God Himself talks about that and says, I am putting my name on the people and blessing them. And and maybe the last best great example The church is the bride of Christ. Just like when a a bride doesn't take her old name that she was born with, but takes the name of her husband, the church takes the name of her bridegroom, which is Christ. Christ who loves the church and gave himself up for her. All right, so we, we could call the church the Lord. How can we call it our righteousness? It's because through the church, Jesus gives us his righteousness. The church is wherever the gospel is proclaimed and the sacraments are administered. So when when I preach the word of God to you and read the word of God to you, it is declaring the forgiveness of sins in Christ. When a, a baby or person is baptized, they are being washed clean of all of their sins and be, are being clothed with Christ's righteousness. Whenever we have the Lord's Supper, we declare the Lord's coming until the Lord's death until He comes. And the Lord gives us His true body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. So wherever, wherever the church is, the righteousness of Christ is being handed out. And conversely, wherever the righteousness of Christ is being handed out, there you find the true church. Jesus came in humility to become our righteousness. And through the humble means of the church, He gives us that righteousness. Which is why we are all here right now. Here is where the Lord prepares us for His coming. Here is where He He pulls us out of the hole of our sins. Here is where He offers us the forgiveness of sins. Here we find the Lord our righteousness. Amen. The peace of God which transcends all understanding. Guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.